might have a couple more people trail in um, as uh, the time goes on. But hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming today. Um, this is our second talk on PMNR. Uh, today, we have Dr. Wu, who is going to talk about co the conservative management of cervical spine disorders. And just a bit about Dr. Wu, um, he cares for patients with chronic back, neck, and other kinds of musculoskeletal pain uses ultrasound and x-ray technologies to perform image guided injections to alleviate pain. And he also uses regenerative therapies like platelet rich plasma. So um, a lot of exciting stuff and we're excited to hear from him today. So thank you for being here and thank you for presenting Dr. Wu. Sure, uh, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm just happy to present today's talk on uh, the way physical medicine and rehab uh, manages cervical spine disorders in a conservative way. So um, go ahead and start and introduce uh, my service, which is we're part of the uh, UCSF non-operative spine service, which is within a section of PM&R and uh, falls into the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. And um, these are our providers. Currently, there's uh, four of us. We're expanding to a fifth provider pretty shortly. Um, and I think you'll be hearing from these folks uh, in this uh, talk series coming up um, later uh, in February or March. And so we practice at different locations uh, around the UCSF campus. Also satellite clinics in the East Bay and North Bay. Um, I understand, so you guys had a um, presentation by uh, Dr. Del Rosario for the first um, talk in this series, and I hope uh, she laid out sort of the, the lay of the land for PM&R, but I created this slide hopefully to help um, folks locate where my service, at least, fits within the, the broader PM&R scheme and framework. So uh, hopefully she presented multiple subspecialties of PM&R, and then you'll hear from different providers on those. Um, the way I can sort of conceptualize PMR subspecialties, if you look at just the main table, there's an outpatient setting and an inpatient setting where uh, folks practice. And so if you guys are considering a career in PMR, this could be one type of breakdown in terms of if you prefer an inpatient type of um, practice or outpatient. Uh, those practices that span both kind of have uh, practices within both settings. Sometimes it's related to surgical needs that the patients are inpatient. Sometimes it's more of a consultative role on the inpatient service for, for example, those ones that span the midline, pediatric rehab, amputee care, um, medical rehab, which includes cardiovascular, respiratory, cancer rehab, which are all emerging fields of rehab, musculoskeletal, um, it can span post-surgical, uh, especially joint replacements that relate to the orthopedics area. Those on the left half, which is, which is outpatient, um, you know, fall within the neuromuscular area where they do EMG studies, sports medicine, uh, treating athletes. Um, and then spine and pain is somewhat of an overlap area where we're all outpatient for the most part. And we see patients with acute or chronic, but non-emergency or non-surgical types of uh, issues. On the inpatient side, you'll hear um, about brain injury, stroke, and spinal cord. Uh, the other way to think about it uh, on the left hand of this uh, slide is that a lot of rehab, and the goal of rehab is to restore function, um, uh, works on a spectrum of dealing with central dysfunction so if you imagine central, the highest being the brain, where people have brain injury or stroke, uh, all the way towards the bottom, which is peripheral dysfunction, which is orthopedic or um, limb or you know, periphery. So I laid out these uh, subspecialties along the spectrum going from central to peripheral. The right half of the slide demonstrates just the overlap because PMR is so broad in terms of the different departments, the different areas, um, the focus of training that you might emphasize if you subspecialize in one of these areas that, um, you know, for central dysfunction, you work in neurology, uh, pain with anesthesiology, 
um, the medical aspects with either family medicine, primary care, internal medicine. And then uh, typically what we find on the West Coast is PM&R being aligned with orthopedics. These are also departments where you might end up um, receiving fellowship training for these areas uh, to subspecialize in. So for example, my training was in pain and then um, the fellowship program uh, was sponsored by the anesthesiology department. So that's the majority of cases for pain. So I'd like to just start and go through this talk. I uh, won't spend too much time on each particular slide, but probably use this case to go through uh, how we manage. Quality treatment will be good. Then I urge you to, I Okay, so, um, so the case is, this is exemplifies um, the complexity of a particular neck disorder patient. He has neck and shoulder pain and arm numbness. He's 55, has a history of hypermobility, a remote history of a ski accident injuring his neck, but resolved, and presents after he had a motor vehicle accident when, in which he is, um, in which he was a motorcycle rider that got hit by a truck uh, presented to me about six months afterwards uh, with injuries, uh, multiple injuries to the spine, but were all managed without surgical intervention, uh, brain bleed from that injury, and then some PTSD from that trauma, and complains about neck shoulder pain, um, dysesthesias of um, the upper extremities, and a presentation of itchiness along the outer aspects and tops of his forearms. So that's fairly common. Here's a catalog of his injuries from that motor vehicle accident. So multiple areas of the vertebral bodies as well as thoracic uh, vertebral bodies. Um, nothing was really displaced, luckily. And then uh, some of the vertebral fractures in the neck did affect the foramen where the spinal nerves exit, but didn't really impinge or anything like that. So he was fairly lucky. Um, he did have to undergo a lot of uh, recovery to allow for these bones to heal and then the pain to subside. His description of the pain was four to eight out of 10, achy, stabby, burning, uh, flame-like pain uh, in the neck, thoracic spine. So that spans a spectrum of what we think about inflammatory and nerve types of pain based on this description. That was associated with numbness, tingling, dorsal forearms, entire hands and all fingers. Couldn't really um, have achieved full strength in the third digit, um, both hands. Some discoordination, some weakness, also some visual disturbances and kind of walking um, imbalance. Everything was worse with lying on his back, but better with lying on his sides. So in terms of seeing this type of patient, we'll go through a little bit of background. <coughs> as to epidemiology of neck pain. Um, so age-related degenerative changes are almost universal. They may begin as early as the first decade of life. Um, population studies have shown that about 80 to 90% of folks have disc degeneration on MRI by age of 50 years. Uh, clinical features of this type of degeneration called spondylosis are more common in men than women with peak incidence in the 40s to 60s. Um, at any point, and this was a CDC survey in 2009, uh, neck pain can affect 15% of the population uh, with, it, with that incidence every three months. Uh, there's a prevalence annually of 37% and a lifetime prevalence up to almost 50%. And um, neck pain results in increased um, healthcare costs, expenditure, uh, missed days from work, reduced productivity, rising insurance costs, amounting to you know billions of dollars uh, of healthcare expenditure. Um, virtually all patients have some degree of degeneration with age, <clears throat> including uh, disc degeneration, foraminal narrowing, bone spurring, uh, facet arthritis, which are the joints in the spine. Why some patients have symptoms um, and others don't uh, is unclear could be related to anatomical configurations or genetics, especially if they have a narrow spinal canal where the spinal cord travels. And then a lot of it relates to contributions from lifestyle risk factors for developing symptoms. So including poor sleep, stress, um, smoking, overall poor health, 
being sedentary, um, having history of neck pain in the past will have uh, increase or associate with increased risk of having neck pain in the future, just as it is with low back pain, history of trauma and repetitive work injuries. So we kind of see a mixture of how neck pain presents and it's a mix of both nerve related and generally sort of um, local tissue pain related pain. 50% or 50, over 50% 50 of folks will have some mixture of nerve involvement in their pain. And then less than 50% will have strictly um, just local pain inflammation, not nerve related. Typically nerve related pain is, is for the most part radicular, which is spinal nerve root issues. Um, and that contributes to the overall pain. It's related to degeneration and um, possibly underlying that is disc herniation. Um, with nerve involvement, uh, nerve related pain, it's greater likelihood of having chronic pain and psychosocial involvement or functional impairment. Um, and briefly for these slides, I'll just go through the highlight points. So if patients present with acute pain, we typically expect acute pain, whether it's sort of a lifting injury or sleeping on the wrong side of the bed, um, something where they tweak their neck while um, at the computer. Typically it resolves over a couple of months. Um, about 50% continue to have low grade symptoms, recurrences and flares and uh, beyond a year. And so um, these are similar risk factors for transitioning from acute to chronic pain. When it involves uh, spinal nerve roots, uh, there's a worse prognosis than if it was strictly just neck pain, like a muscle, muscle knot or something in your shoulders. Um, they typically will improve. So 50% disc herniations decrease after uh, six months and, you know, 75% um, decrease even further when it's uh, further out in like two years or so. So most of the cervical radicular pain um, will improve by six months. And we educate our patients that it may take anywhere from six months to two to three years for them to actually feel better or for their actual issue to subside. Recurrences will occur, but for the most part, you know, a great majority of patients will feel better <clears throat> years on out. Stenosis, which is more of a degenerative process in the central, central canal, um, you know, you'll hear is, is not necessarily the same process and it is sort of a progressive thing. Um, and when that does progress, it sort of narrows down on the central aspect where the spinal cord uh, travels. And that typically is what we call like a myelitis or a myelopathy. Um, and that can lead to upper motor neuron signs. It suggests something central is happening rather than just the nerve roots. Uh, leading causes in the young uh, patients are trauma. In older patients, it's degeneration. So it's highly variable. It's not always the same natural history expect a natural history from a disc herniation. Um, you might have, you know, periods of uh, relapse, then recurrence and progression uh, over years. <clears throat> and um, typically that is down that road is an indication for surgery at some point. We look for key um, points in our uh, history taking to figure out what the source of pain is. So we ask about the history. Trauma is especially important and, and particularly relevant for this case um, versus like degeneration. Uh, we asked for um, past medical history that might uh, associate with increased risks for neck issues and nerve issues. Uh, some of it might be congenital, some of it might be uh, incurred. So um, if they have repetitive work injury, they'll have probably some impingement um, and then prior surgery. So we look especially for neck surgeries, prior shoulder surgeries, and shoulder surgeries if their shoulder pain can confound the picture a little bit. Uh, we try to split up the differential diagnoses into whether it's really nerve related or really just inflammatory or nociceptive. So we kind of listen to the descriptors of pain, <clears throat> whether it's nerve related is burning, electric shooting, and nociceptive, which is more like the achy, deep, throbby, but there's always overlap. And so um, some nerve related compression might initially present acutely as central pain where the disc hurts. And then as that disc essentially bulges out later on, 
um, they may start feeling the, the nerve pain that might run down their arm. Um, some arthritic pains will just feel like stiffness in their neck. Um, beyond that, we try to isolate if, um, after we kind of think about if it's nerve or axial, uh, <clears throat> where that pain is coming from. If it's axial, think about something that's in the center of the spine. So disc or facet joints or muscles that sit along either side of the spine. Um, some of it can actually just be muscular pain and that's reactive to something that happened um, to the disc or something deeper. And so that can accompany um, a possible disc herniation as well and may contribute to over 50% of the actual symptoms. And then we think about if it's more than actual and it actually goes down the arm, whether it's actually radicular, which is what we call radiating pain down the arm, uh, or referred pain, which is where you have pain that just kind of feels like it's um, felt somewhere different than where the actual source is. We try to match dermatomes to the nerve roots uh, to, to determine which nerve root might be involved, but oftentimes it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. There's always a possibility that there's um, overlap in um, different nerve roots causing the same type of symptom. Then we try to uh, determine even more whether there's exacerbating postures or activities, things like coughing and sneezing can aggravate um, discogenic pain um, that might um, secondarily affect nerve root pain. And then we ask, in addition to that, some alleviating factors. Uh, we factor in whether or not there's a likelihood of increased progression to chronic pain if they have mood disorders, like this patient has PTSD, sleep disorders, which this patient also has. He has ob obstructive sleep apnea. So anytime disruption to mood and pain occur, it can actually amplify um, patient's pain. We look for uh, ruling out associated factors or uh, alternate diagnoses that say it's non-spinal. So CRPS, which is a um, neurogenic or um, a neuropathic type of condition can often cause arm pain in a nerve type of presentation, but it's not actually related to the neck. There are strict criteria to rule these things out, for example, for CRPS. Uh, we try to rule out red flags or identify red flags and surgical indications. So especially if they have motor weakness, some discoordination that can't be explained, sensory loss. So we test out the light touch sensation, upper motor neuron signs, constitutional symptoms that might suggest uh, maybe an oncologic process. And we try to identify whether or not there are underlying um, past medical conditions that their symptoms can be attributed to beyond the spine. So for example, rheumatoid arthritis um, is associated or predisposes to the risk of a subluxation of the, the upper um, vertebral bodies in the spine as this arrow points out on a sagittal view of an MRI. If we can see that there's the, um, the atlas is displaced forward and I'm pointing out here that it's actually displaced so that it's pinching the spinal cord. And so we kind of watch out for those predisposing past medical issues. Um, and specifically for central stenosis, we try to expand our thinking to the possibility of myelopathy, which is going to present in not just upper extremity um, symptoms, but also might lead to lower extremity symptoms because it's impinging on the spinal cord, which carries all the nerves that goes down to the sacrum. Um, it could be weakness in the legs, discoordination and balance problems, and not just neck pain. So we always have to keep that um, uh, you know, watchful uh, monitoring for these other types of symptoms. Beyond that, we look for a history of <clears throat> medication use to help us guide our current management plan, interventions tried, rehab tried, um, alternative therapies tried. So going back to our case, this patient had already presented six months after his um, accident, having tried a nerve pain medication, Cymbalta, muscle relaxant, uh, methylcarbamol, anti-inflammatories, Tylenol, uh, opioids, which are for breakthrough pain. He's explored um, cannabinoids, topical uh, approaches as well. Uh, 
you know, we kind of look for limitations in the options that we have available. So he's trying nerve pain medications that have resulted in intolerable side effects. So we don't really try to repeat those in the future. We try to look for alternative options in the same class or same type of uh, medications to, to help um, better manage his pain. Unfortunately, he has um, reflux and he couldn't really tolerate the anti-inflammatory class. So that was kind of um, a restriction for our um, choices. He's also tried, uh, you know, multiple rehab measures, including physical therapy, which is always what we try to incorporate um, as part of our care. He's tried modalities um, for, uh, sorry, actually just going down the list, he's tried um, sort of mechanical therapies of inversion, um, mind-body exercises like yoga, Pilates, Feldenkrais, uh, passive modalities where he has chiropractic manipulations and massage, modalities like ice, heat, and therapeutic ultrasound, which is another way to uh, introduce heat but deeper into the soft tissue, and then complementary therapies like acupuncture, and then cognitive behavioral therapies like meditation. So once hearing the patient's history, we started thinking about what it could be, uh, what are likely pain generators, and so Breaking it down to the way we collected our history, we think about what's axial pain. So axial pain can be discogenic. Associated uh, symptoms with disc-related pain are headaches. It can refer to the shoulder. Doesn't really travel that far down the arm, so it's not ridiculous. Can go to the eye, you know, which he had actually eye issues. Vestibular dysfunction, so he had a little bit of um, walking difficulties afterwards can actually refer, if it's low enough in the spine, refer to the chest wall. Um, and so these, these uh, highlighted points in red, I, I'll just let you read, but I won't necessarily go over for each slide. Also, axial pain can relate to that spondylosis that I was mentioning, which is a progressive deterioration of the osteocartilaginous components of the spine, most often related to aging, but often can be affected by trauma. So pain from the facet joints, which are identified here, that stabilize the spine, can also cause headaches. In addition to neck pain, it can also refer in expected patterns, depending on the level of the facet joint that's affected, uh, refer towards the shoulder, refer towards the shoulder blade. And so sometimes we try to match that to identify the particular joint that's affected. He had a motor vehicle accident, so pertinent to this is whiplash and up to 50% of pain after whiplash can be from facet joints. Um, subsides over time, but I think um, it could be a big contributing factor to ongoing pain. And then on top of all this is the musculoskeletal system reacting to deeper pain like the disc or the joint. Um, and so a lot of times people like over 50% will have muscular tension, even if they're just, you know, especially if they're sitting at the desk for long periods, their muscles get overused and fatigued and deconditioned. Facet, uh, facetogenic pain can often underlie muscle spasms. So people who have facet issues might just describe their symptoms solely as, I just have muscle spasms. And then myofascial pain with these trigger points are um, uh, often is described as a presence of palpable trigger points which are taut muscular, muscular bands that can refer in a defined pattern, um, uh, especially when palpated, they can refer spontaneously without palpation and that, that would be an active trigger point. But if it's uh, elicited only uh, with palpation, that can also be sort of a, a confirmatory diagnosis. Often the muscle tension uh, for these taut muscular bands can actually clamp down on certain peripheral nerves that travel through the muscle layers, they travel up through the scalp, um, such as most, most, you know, most prevalently is, is the occipital nerves. The greater occipital nerves, um, they come off of medial branches of C2. A third occipital nerve comes uh, off of medial branches of C3. Patients can report this as um, paroxysmal shooting or stabbing pain, electric light shock pain that radiates from the occiput all the way to the vertex and uh, also retroorbitally. They may also describe um, sensitivity to the scalp by touch uh, or sensitivity to pressure. 
in our particular patient, he has um, obstructive sleep apnea. He has to wear a CPAP device to help him breathe overnight. And he described that that's the strap that ties around, uh, that ties the CPAP to his mouth, wraps around right over the occiput where these nerves travel. So he, he does report some of this happening to him. This is just a picture of the distribution of where pain or symptoms might be felt by affected nerves. And here is just, as I mentioned, the muscle layers that occipital nerves have to travel through that make it more likely that muscle tension can cause a neuralgia of these nerves. Um, now, if we're thinking outside of axial pain, we're thinking more radicular pain that goes down particular dermatomes, then we think about cervical dermatomes, which really affect the arms, possibly down to the armpit, but not so, not so far. Um, and so we think about areas that might affect the, the nerve roots, whether it's the neuroforamen, where it's the exit of where the nerve roots um, uh, exit the spine or the central spine where the spinal cord travels down the spine. Um, and then moving to physical exam, if we have these diagno the differential diagnosis in mind, we you know, try to keep things um, we try to sort of focus the physical exam and tailor it to testing out the items on the differential. But typically this is the, the sort of the more comprehensive description of everything that we have to go through if we don't have anything particular to look at. Patients will often present with just neck pain and it's very nonspecific. So we look at the muscles of the neck through inspection. We look at the spinal alignment, look at how um, their head sits, their posture, they have some kyphosis. We ask them to move their neck, cervical range of motion, and see the degree that they're able to achieve that and whether or not that's um, provocative of any of their symptoms. So um, then we do palpation specifically to identify either a midline pain that suggests disc type of pain or muscular or facetogenic pain, which is off to the sides of the midline, which we call paraspinal. Um, and then if we're thinking about neurologists, we'll probably tap on you know, particular areas that we know uh, historically um, elicits that neuralgia pain. So like a tenels. So we tap on the occip occiput to see if the great occipital nerves are involved. We also tap on particular areas of, we know peripheral nerve entrapment at the medial elbow for the ulnar nerve, the volar wrist for the median nerve, which is, is commonly carpal tunnel issues. Uh, we do specific tests or special tests this one particular is Sperling's, um, and the, the description of Sperling's is variable, so different folks will do it differently. Uh, some will incorporate neck extension, so have the patient look upwards towards the ceiling. Other folks don't do neck extension, they just do rotation and tilt. Other folks um, don't apply direct pressure on the head. Some, some people will apply pressure on the vertex of the head to um, to increase the uh, sensitivity of the test. What it does is really to close that neuroframe in around the spinal nerve root and elicit uh, or provoke any type of impingement that might be happening that would uh, help confirm, so rule in or rule out um, a, a radicular issue. Um, it is limited by the sort of the degree of sensitivity and specificity. Um, so it is more specific. So if it is positive, it will indicate more likely than not there is some nerve root impingement. And I won't go through each aspect of this, but we do run through the motor exam for strength using particular parts of the exam to help us identify which particular nerve root is involved. We also go through the neurological exam for sensation. Um, this uh, you might hear a little bit more from maybe a spinal cord injury talk but this is uh, what we call the Asia exam or American Spinal Injury Association examination of the run through of all the dermatomes um, through uh, particular points of testing in the body that can help focalize um, which particular nerve level uh, sensory deficits are actually coming from. Um, and then we'll use reflexes to identify or distinguish between upper uh, motor neuron um, issues, suggesting something that is in the spinal cord or spinal 
uh, canal versus lower motor neuron issues, which is something that is essentially distal to the spinal cord, which is nerve roots or peripheral nerves. So that's, that's really the relevance for uh, reflexes for, for our parts of the exam. And then there are specific, you know, upper motor neuron testing that we do. One is called the Hoffman's response. Um, and if it is positive, um, that suggests something that is upper motor neuron. Um, because we're also concerned about myelopathy, and like we mentioned, if it was central canal stenosis impinging on the spinal cord, we'll also test out the, the lower uh, extremity reflexes as well. And if there is a Babinski reflex, which is the upward pointing toe, which would indicate some upper motor neuron condition that, you know, we, we kind of also look at if there's increased reflexivity or hyperreflexia in the patella and the Achilles that makes it all consistent with something that's actually happening, upper motor neuron, that makes us a little bit more concerned about myelopathy. Um, so for our practice in this in spine and pain, we always kind of keep in mind the anatomy. So with PMNR, I think outpatient practices rely a lot on knowing the musculoskeletal system, the attachments of muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, as well as the, the nerve distributions uh, where nerves lie. Um, and I think this is uh, very relevant for our type of practice um, where we just have to keep in mind uh, the brachial plexus, the lumbosacral plexus, in terms of directing our uh, differential diagnoses as well as physical examination. Um, so we're, we're also, it's also important to rule out whether things outside of the spine are actually the, the, uh, the causes of the symptom. So we'll do a shoulder exam, especially if we're looking at neck disorders. So we'll do a shoulder exam uh, to rule out you know, uh, shoulder pathology, rotator cuff pathology, arthritis, um, this patient did have shoulder issues, so we had to do that for him. Uh, we'll do special tests to identify different parts of the brachial plexus that might underlie his um, dysesthesias in his upper extremities. Um, beyond that plexus, distal to that, we'll also do some neural tension tests for each of the individual large fiber nerves, the median, the radial, the ulnar nerves. The, the series of three pictures here on this slide are the special types of tests that we do for thoracic outlet. And it uh, basically identifies uh, particular locations of impingement. So the absence will try to test out whether impingement is happening from the scalene muscles in the neck. Edens will test out whether there's a costoclavicular impingement between the clavicle and the first rib. And the rights exam will test out whether there's a tight pec minor muscle. Okay, and then this is neural tension testing of the different nerves in the arm distal to the plexus. So going back to our case, what did we find? So on physical examination, palpation showed tenderness of palpation and the upper trapezius worsened with extension of the neck. So looking upwards and tilting his neck to the right. So that to me suggested something might be a combination of facet pain and then reactive muscle pain on his uh, upper trapezius. There's also tenderness of palpation in the right paraspinal um, and occiput areas. So involvement of the paraspinal areas, uh, you know, paraspinal muscles, uh, which could potentially impinge on those greater occipital nerves um, that causes his uh, occipital headache and vertex uh, types of headache. Uh, so we're thinking maybe there's a neuralgia happening with the occipital nerves. Some diminished light test sensation on D3, which is a, the third finger on both sides, um, which based on the dermatonal distribution, that may suggest there's some involvement of a C7, you know, radiculopathy on both sides. It could also suggest maybe there's a radial nerve component, uh, maybe a median nerve component because they, those peripheral nerves also affect the third fingers. Um, reassuringly, he had normal strength, normal sensation and reflexes. So we weren't really concerned about any upper motor neuron issues. Uh, so once we've seen the patient, we kind of determine whether or not we need to do further uh, diagnostic studies. 
MRI, um, CT, EMG studies are more are the advanced um, diagnostics that we typically pursue. MRI is the most um, commonly used, and then CT scans probably a surgeon would order. But um, if we end up seeing anything that travels, uh, radiates or uh, refers out of the neck, down the arms, suggesting nerve involvement, we'll think about doing an MRI. So MRIs are really great to look at soft tissue injury, disc herniations, uh, impingement of the nerve roots, uh, edema, maybe bone healing, tumors. Um, and then CT scans are really just 3D x-rays that allows us to look at bone spurs, disc calcifications, if, if this is a known chronic issue, especially if MRIs are contraindicated and if they have uh, a pacemaker that's incompatible or spinal cord stimulator that's incompatible with MRI because it's a large magnet, uh, aneurysm clips, then we have to rely on CT scans. And there are special types of CT scans that we order if uh, we really want to look at the nerve roots, which involves contrast. Um, again, with MRI, there is um, false positives, false negatives. Um, here, just to highlight this, is that the MRI may identify the affected nerve root in 73% of the time. So not all MRI findings are actually clinically relevant. So that's fairly important, and that's what we actually educate our patients on. <clears throat> that we can see multiple findings. They may be very concerned about this or that. You know, the radiologist will call it as severe or something, but they have no symptoms on the left. They have these findings um, <clears throat> all on the left, but their symptoms are on the right. So in those cases, we'll have to educate and say, you know, MRIs, we don't treat the MRI, we'll treat the patient's symptoms. <clears throat> if we're doing uh, EMG or nerve conduction studies, which EMG is electromyography and nerve conduction studies, um, these are ordered to evaluate if there's spinal nerve root abnormalities. If we can't really differentiate whether it's coming from the spine or from the plexus or from the peripheral nerve roots, uh, the EMG study, in addition to an MRI, will help confirm whether uh, or the presence of, a, of nerve root dysfunction um, or a plexopathy or peripheral neuropathy. And then it'll help identify which nerve roots um, might be affected the severity of that and whether or not there's actually re or healing uh, of, a, of a remote chronic um, nerve injury. Again, this has also its sensitivity. Um, and so there's a timing in terms of ordering the EMG that it won't pick up any problem if it's the injury happened too recently. So it, a non-diagnostic test does not exclude a possible nerve issue. Um, whether it's because of timing, whether it's because it doesn't pick up small fiber problems, it only looks at large fiber problems. Large fibers being things like the median nerve, the ulnar nerve, or the radial nerve, and the small fiber problems being like C fibers um, that are just very sensory. Um, so going back to the case, we did do an MRI for him that showed disc degeneration at C3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 7, associated to disc degeneration, when those kind of lose, when the discs kind of lose their, lose their cushioning, um, a lot of the biomechanical body weight, um, daily activity stresses get translated to the vertebral bones. And you'll see maybe stress response or inflammation in the bones that the, um, the field just calls modic changes at the end plate, which are the surfaces of the vertebral bodies. Um, he also had disc osteophytes, which are bone spurs um, that follow or accompany disc degeneration. He had mild facet arthritis, so those joints are, are a little bit irritated. He had severe foraminal stenosis, so on both sides, <clears throat> which is where the um, space where the nerve roots exit. Um, so this is just a one section of his MRI. So we can kind of look right down the central canal on a side view. This is a midline cut right through the midline and he's facing towards the left of the screen on the left half of the picture. Uh, the plenty of cerebral spinal fluid, so the white fluid surrounding this dark spinal cord that runs through the canal. Um, but the vertebral bones kind of see, they're not fully square on this cross section. So they looked kind of like the corners are pinched. So those would be the osteophytes. And then these dark sort of um, 
uh, areas are the discs. So certain discs higher up are a little thicker or taller, and then discs here where the yellow line crosses are a little flatter, and those are discs show disc degeneration. So the cross section of where this yellow reference line is, is shown on the right half of the screen. And then we get a sense, and I'll just point this out to you, that this is the area where the nerve roots exit on either side, and it's a little pinched. So that's what is the foraminal stenosis that they're referring to. Here's the central spinal cord, and there's plenty of spinal fluid around it. This white margin around it. So the main issue, I think, seemed to come from the foraminal stenosis for him. We also did a EMG study to help us determine which nerves were involved. Uh, <clears throat> there was evidence and uh, of peripheral polyneuropathy. So that suggests that there is some issue that's affecting this, this sort of not the large fiber nerves, but maybe smaller fiber nerves are involved, but there's evidence of this. There is also evidence of moderate uh, median neuropathy at the wrist, which is essentially carpal tunnel issues. So there, this particular finding suggests there's a peripheral nerve issue, the median nerve. Um, median nerve being involved, I think, would um, correlate with his third finger um, sort, of sense of, sort of loss of sensation or diminished light touch sensation. Um, there was also finding or evidence of a left ulnar peripheral neuropathy at the elbow, uh, which is another area where you know, we tested out on the physical exam. So that correlates with dysesthesias on the ring finger, possibly the pinky finger as well for the left. And there was chronic left C5 radiculopathy. Um, although I think his symptoms may uh, not necessarily correlate with this C5 issue. So once we have our information, we kind of move on to treatment. Uh, and so just to describe physical medicine and rehab, really we try to incorporate multimodal approaches, multidisciplinary care. So we work uh, in a broad team that incorporates not just us as the physician, but physical therapists, um, acupuncturists, chiropractors, uh, pain psychologists, um, uh, all sorts of different pr practitioners uh, between departments. So neurology, rheumatology, um, all sorts. And then even, you know, among different subspecialties in, in rehab for complex cases. Uh, and for this patient, maybe even sports medicine might, might have uh, needed to be involved. Um, so we really try to um, optimize conservative management, typically through what we already did uh, so far, diagnostically, and then pharmacologically with medications, physical therapies for rehabilitation, um, interventions like injections that we do, um, maybe cognitive behavioral uh, approaches that fall within uh, rehabilitation and the physical therapies. Um, before we try to, you know, before we exhaust options that then sort of the last resort is probably something surgical if needed. This is a typical um, sort of um, catalog of everything that we kind of keep in mind in terms of coming up with a treatment plan. So everything sort of related to medication options that are going to be very focused on the type of uh, pain we're trying to address. So anti-inflammatories or steroids, we're trying to reduce inflammation. Muscle relaxants, we're trying to reduce myofascial pain or spasms. Um, these antidepressants and anti-seizure medications are really the class of nerve pain medications that we use to address nerve pain. Um, down here is all the physical therapy types of approaches and the modalities. On the right upper column is the complementary approaches, um, the psychological therapies. Um, then we go to procedures to address particular pain sources that we can identify. Um, and then these regenerative approaches that are more um, sort of less supported with evidence before we get to the surgical. Uh, so we keep in mind this multimodal approach, uh, all of these types of approaches 
we can introduce or reintroduce down the road if things seem to have diminishing effects, we might kind of revisit something that we tried earlier uh, to address chronic pain. And so th this is what we try to do, multidisciplinary integrated care. So rather than having the patients go to multiple different departments, we try to use sort of our PM and our training to synthesize everything and help coordinate this whole team, if you will, of providers to address a complex issue. So for this patient, uh, the assessment was from the exam, from the diagnostics, he had some myofascial pain, possible occipital neuralgia causing his headaches, um, radicular or nerve root pain coming from those foraminal stenoses on both sides, possibly uh, nerve related um, underpinnings for this itchiness he's getting on these both, both arms, and then some pain from those joints. The plan we came up for him was, you know, continue to continue to, to cycle through different options for medications for muscle relaxation, nerve pain, uh, inflammation. We pursued an epidural steroid injection, um, which actually helped relieve a lot of his upper arm symptoms with lasting effects. And that's probably already two months now. We are pursuing a series of treatments of trigger point injections, which are really small needle types of procedures for the muscles to relax his muscles, which are helping substantially. And then we did some nerve blocks, which is again, putting lidocaine next to those, uh, possibly steroid next to those um, irritated occipital nerves. And of course, everything involves patient education. So we do run through um, pain, uh, the psychology of pain, the pain experience, the, the chronic, sort of how pain becomes chronic, there's going to be ups and downs. We'll have more pain one day, less pain the other day. And that's just a part of the process. But as long as we rule out um, red flags, significant issues that might cause uh, a structural problem uh, and cause severe issues, we are essentially working with um, his pain issues. The plan also did involve multidisciplinary care. So just for his multiple other problems, uh, I recommend a referral to neurology to work on his visual issues and balance. We try to look at an ultrasound dynamic to look at whether his nerves in the arms were causing sub subluxation or getting impinged there. Um, he needed some braces for his carpal tunnel. So I recommended that for his wrist. Um, because of multiple fractures, I recommended him to skeletal health to really optimize his bone health. And this is part of the preventative care and sort of what aligns with uh, medicine that we do is to make sure we uh, stave off future problems or recurrence of problems. And then he had this question of connective tissue disorders because he presented with hypermobility. So, you know, the thought was maybe start with rheumatology to see if there is a rheumatologic connective tissue issue or possibly then go to genetics to, to sort of tease that out. So referrals, you know, we are as a specialist in PMNR, what type of patients get referred to us uh, for spine in particular is they need spinal workup. They want to um, have us look at advanced imaging or studies, um, then to interpret those advanced uh, studies, management of ongoing chronic refractory symptoms that the initial care, maybe a primary care physician seen that, saw them earlier, tried physical therapy, but it didn't really help out. So then we have to sort of help along with the, a more complex case down this road. Uh, and then just continue to manage chronic pain patients. Uh, we also provide those interventions that we, uh, I described there. And then we kind of also serve as triage in terms of flagging down, you know, more concerning issues. Um, we can work in tandem with our orthopedic surgeons if we identify red flags. Um, that indicates some surgical intervention is needed. So um, I was asked to just kind of go through a, a typical day or work week. So for the most part, we, we see patients in clinic, we kind of do all of the above, we evaluate, we kind of go through image findings. Um, in clinic, you know, certain people will have training to do procedures, ultrasound guided procedures for injections, typically of joints, but also we can target nerves to block out nerves uh, that, are, that possibly are impinged and causing pain. Uh, in clinic, we also do uh, 
trigger point injections. These are the small needle injections to release muscle tension. And then the advanced procedures for spinal injections under x-ray guidance. So we do epidural steer injections, deeper joint injections in the spine, maybe uh, nerve blocks. Um, so a collection of different things. My typical work week is, uh, you know, there's an academic day, three clinic days throughout the week. One of them has ultrasound injections or in-clinic procedures, uh, and then x-ray guided uh, spinal injections on another day. So I'd like to stop it there and thank you for your attention. I'll, um, if there's any particular questions either about uh, cervical disorders or uh, my specialty or our field, I'm happy to take them. Thank you so much, Dr. Wu. Um, this is Casey here. I am helping to run the course with uh, mm -hmm. Eva May and Ariana, but Ariana had to step out. Mm -hmm. um, while you were talking, we had a question come in over the chat. So Ted McLeod was wondering um, how you came to choose PM&R in the first mm -hmm. place and then specifically yeah. spine disorders within the other subspecialties within physiatry. Um, my background was engineering and I think that to me led to biomechanics as a subset of engineering. So um, I was naturally interested from there on uh, translating the engineering to something clinical or medical. And then um, it kind of made sense because mechanical engineering kind of uh, what appealed to me from that standpoint was the musculoskeletal system. And then I think that decision sort of at each point of the training, you'll probably get more information or learn more about it that sort of redirects you down different branch points. So I think when I got towards rehab from the engineering background, um, I naturally got interested into the holistic type of approach, the multimodal approach that it did. Um, I found it fascinating that pain was involved uh, with the psychology, the, the, the behavioral, a lot of the socio, um, social factors as well. So I think pain kind of appealed for me down once I got down that road. And I guess one follow-up question is um, like it does, I'm mm -hmm. wondering if, um, do, you, do you get the sense that across physiatry, people really do think of um, sort of rehab, but then also pain as sort of this holistic diagnostic and treatment thing? Or do you feel like that's sort of a specific area within PM&R? Or is that the overall philosophy of it? Uh, so within rehab or generally within the pain field? Today? I guess I'm asking, I'm wondering about both sort of, yeah, with that, within yeah. PM&R generally and then within pain, whether it's PM&R or other, otherwise. Uh, PM&R probably is more, um, it, it readily sort of, um, has an inclination to involve the multimodal approach just because the, the training involves working in teams and multiple different specialists from, from the very beginning. So I think that sort of naturally fits into the PMR philosophy. I think in the pain field, um, it may have taken different timing. Uh, I know that from the anesthesiology fellowship programs for pain, they are incorporating more PM&R uh, approach, sort of multimodal approaches. So I think the pain field does recognize the contribution of PM&R to pain um, medicine, right? So it's not just all about procedures. They do um, really emphasize physical therapies. The pain psychology is a big part of it. And so a lot of education and meeting with a cognitive behavioral therapist is a big part of the pain um, management plan. And then just, I think what's emerging more, but it's kind of also limited by uh, reimbursement is having functional restoration programs. So in the name itself, functional restoration is sort of a goal or philosophy for rehab, which is to restore function. And the, these programs are really for chronic pain patients where they've gone through a lot. There's not a lot of anatomical problems that will lead to severe detriment. They have problems, but they're really working around a chronic pain condition. And so how do we get them back functional is through these types of programs. 
Interesting, thank you. Um, and we're just about out of time, but I do wanna read this last question coming from Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, anyone who needs to sign off, go ahead and do it. But um, Sarah is wondering if you could explain a little, a little more about the patients with a disconnect between the M MRI findings and their clinical presentation. Mm -hmm. And she says that she's had tr trouble finding a way yeah. to get patients to buy into the fact that MRI findings aren't necessarily the same. Yeah, so I almost kind of said said it the way I would say it to my patients in the talk. I, I, um, I'll say it to them and say, you know, we want to try to know where your symptoms are because that's what's bothering you and that's limiting you. And, you know, we want to focus on that. And if we can correlate those symptoms to some finding in your MRI um, based on our experience. Um, that's what we would treat. And so the other findings may be there. We'll be watchful for those things and also kind of uh, provide uh, recommendations to prevent certain of those things from worsening. But I think, um, you know, we want to treat you as the patient ra rather than the constellation of findings on the MRI. Usually when... I think usually when they hear that, I would say at least 75% of patients will kind of agree, right? There's obviously going to be a lot of patients who are like, well, I'm not satisfied. Why is all this happening? But that might just take um, further explanation of why pain is there or symptoms are there. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate you taking the time today. And I, I feel like, I, I don't know if I'm just speaking for myself, but I feel like that pain, um, pain med medicine is of so much interest sort of across fields and within PM&R and outside of it. Um, so thank you for coming to speak with us. You're welcome. Thank you guys for your attention. Hope to see you guys in the future in our, our rotation. Thanks. Take care.